You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Welcome to my OP Defender childhood, kind of. Uh, this week, we are doing a bonus episode and a regular episode. And what we decided to go with this time is a continuation of Daniel's saga of Disremembered. Uh, we got pretty good feedback last time, so I hope you enjoy this. But as we delve deeper and deeper into the Michael Eisner story, I just, you know, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Encouraging him is 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 good because I, I like this pro- project, so to say. And uh, maybe next season we'll kind of flesh it out into more myopia-tied ideas. So... Um, thanks guys. Enjoy. Welcome to the second episode of Disremembered, the stories behind your childhood. Each week we talk about a little chapter in an important pop culture event behind the great things of your childhood. This season we're focusing on the story behind the Disney Renaissance. Now last week we talked about how Disney spent much of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that sounds like a Rolling Stones greatest hits album, sucking in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Ha! Thank you for laughing. Talking about how Disney was in dire straits, and today we're going to get into their turnaround. My name is Daniel, and on panel we have... Hi, I'm That's Nick, all. host of Myopia yep. to Declare Your Childhood. I'm shoving John violently out of the way no. because I gave him his podcast, damn it. <laughs> it's mine, and you can never take it away. Well, I'd... I'm John, by the way. Well, I'd like to... <laughs> Oh, man. Well, in order to understand Disney's turnaround, what we need to understand is one of the men primarily responsible, and that's Michael Eisner. Now, before I get into the story, I'll just go ahead and ask, uh, starting with you, Nick, what do you remember about Eisner, and where did you first hear about him? Okay, so this is kind of weird in that he wanted to be Walt Disney. I remember a lot of clips of, like, you know, especially when you're watching old shit, right? He's like Walt Disney is always the guy in almost like the Mr. or like the Mr. Rogers like neighborhood kind of like cardigan being like, Welcome to the wonderful world of Disney. Michael Eisner wants to be that, but he looks like a nerdy accountant. There's nothing soft or familiar about him. So when he's on like Good Morning America talking about the new Disney rides or Aladdin, he has no soul or warmth to him. But he's just this guy who's kind of in the way and like and so by the time i understand what's going on i remember him as a family guy caricature with mouse ears on ruining bits of my past (laughs) what about you john yeah similar to nick i vaguely remember him doing kind of cameos on disney stuff like i I remember growing up on basically the disney channel and he showed up every now and then uh kind of like the wonderful world of disney maybe Mm -hmm. that sort of program where, like Nick said, he, he kind of tried to be the, the cuddly uh, mascot for the company. And it was always a bit weird that this guy would try to force himself into this children's programming. <laughs> well, you're not wrong, and you're actually very correct. He was a very nerdy accountant sort of figure. And um, in terms of the Hollywood creative types, not many people actually liked him even before he got to Disney. But we will be getting into that in a moment. That's just who you want running your creative company. Well, I remember him mostly through uh, the parody in Shrek because he was supposed to be Lord Farquaad. <laughs> that's not a joke. That's actually who that was based well, on. I believe it, yeah. Is he compensating for something? <laughs> he very well <laughs> might be. Well, I mean, frankly, you know, DreamWorks can keep Shrek in my memory, so... <laughs> The first one. After that, it kind of um, uh, went downhill. Uh, fair. Yeah. Mm. So let's just get started right at the beginning with Mr. Eisner. He was born in 1942 
in the sort of working class family that lives on Park Avenue in Manhattan. So really tough background. That was supposed to be the laugh line, so... Ha! Oh, sorry, I was muted, right? <laughs> nah, you were muted. But anyway, yes, he grew up in a very affluent but very strict home. He, it was the sort of home where he was expected to wear a jacket and tie to dinner every night. And, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does it now? Before I, actually, <laughs> before I actually get too far into this, I'm just going to give a shout-out real quick. Most of the information I'm getting on his reign at Disney comes from Kim Masters' book, Keys to the Kingdom. Kim Masters is the same person that wrote Hit and Run, the book about John Peters' reign at Sony after the Japanese bought it. John so, Peters is it filmmaker John Peters? No, John Peters is in the producer. John Waters. John oh, Peters oh, is in the yeah. producer that um, uh, demanded Kevin Smith add a spider for Superman to fight to the right. Superman. Yeah. Hey, 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 that's Kevin Smith's only story. Um, <laughs> listen to, uh, what is it, Too Fat to Fly? He's told um, it several times. Yeah. But also, is it wasn't he um, Barbara Streisand's hairdresser? Yes, and later husband. Yes. Oh, god damn. Oh, Which came first? <laughs> I, uh, I assume hairdresser. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know that. <laughs> uh, that's true. I could be wrong. Um... I will say, at this point already, 1942, this is after Disney made it unfashionable, or I guess fashionable to hate Jews, and then unfashionable again. Huh. He was the biggest, like, because the war effort really forced Disney to make a strong left turn, didn't it? Well, I just remember, what was that great old cartoon with Donald Duck as a Nazi in it, where he's, like, having a nightmare oh. where he's living in the Nazi in Nazi Germany and working in a munitions factory? Der Fuhrer's Face, yes. Academy Award-winning short, oh, Der Fuhrer's Face. I show that in class every year. It's awesome. Uh, well, mostly Chris, because Chris, of, uh, of Donald the, uh, Duck giving the Nazi salute. I'm thinking of Donald Duck being the um, the, the illegal immigrant at the Three Caballeros. Oh, yeah! God, that was good. <laughs> I, I noticed that's on Amazon, but it wants me to pay for that, so no. <laughs> So anyway, if you can find it, check out Keys to the Kingdom by Kim Masters or any of their works. They're really good. Now back to the story of Mr. Eisner. Yes. He was expected by his parents to eventually go to Princeton, but he wasn't that good of a student. He didn't really um, do that well in his classes, so he eventually went to Denton and got his degree from there. He also credits this one summer camp called the Key Waden Canoe Camp for Boys in Vermont with being his most positive childhood experience to the point where he sent his own kids there. So after he finished school, he wanted to move on to the entertainment industry, and his first job was in TV as an NBC page like Kenneth in 30 Rock. Later, thanks to his background, especially being part of an affluent family, he got his start as a TV executive. Specifically, he was in charge of cartoons in the 1970s. A gentleman named Barry Diller hired him to ABC when Diller was a young assistant. Diller is important later. Keep him in mind. And um, he's the illegitimate son of Phyllis Diller? Sure, why not? <laughs> so, wait, how does a son of a really affluent uh, family really feel like going into entertainment? Isn't that mm. kind of like... You're thinking about it all wrong, John. You see, there's two ways into comedy. It's either being part of the National Lampoon at Harvard or going to Denton College. <laughs> ah, well, that, that's obviously where you lost me, yeah. <laughs> that was funny in my head and out loud. Thanks, wine. <laughs> well, to answer your question, John, I've actually got Kim Masters' book in front of me. He was a junior in college when he was an NBC page. He later got hired to um, as a logging clerk at NBC, and that involved what commercials were being broadcast. He took a second job doing weekend traffic reports for WNBC Radio. And Did you then, notice how good I was for not making a poop joke when you said logging clerk? Yes, <laughs> I did. Well That's done. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Three months okay. later, and I know that. How did he end up in Texas? 
Well, I'm looking up Denton College, Denton University, and the only thing that comes up is University of North Texas. Oh, boy. We just got... Like, s- maybe it doesn't exist anymore? I'm I not- mean... I mean, it's possible. You can you, you, oh, you bought it out and burned his records. I misread that completely. It wasn't Denton. It was Denison in Granville, Ohio. <laughs> oh, that's completely different. Yes, Denison is. is a place I almost went to. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that's funny. I've screwed. They're fine. Who cares? That's it's Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Oh, people forget Ohio exists. It's that in-between place next to Indiana. Yeah, yeah it's that place where the uh, organized crime people mo- going to Chicago stop by and at least according Shoved to my dad down, chair, down, chair, or, uh, down some stairs right? right that's what that is three months later he moved into a more elevated position at CBS he worked as a commercial coordinator which involved scheduling advertisements that would run during Saturday morning program and eventually was transferred to the games show division. So it was really just a stepping stone for him. He started as a page and then was slowly working up, uh, partly due to his background, partly due to his ambition. It doesn't sound like he's slowly moving anywhere. He's quickly making his way up the ladder. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's funny because we're talking about someone who ends up being super powerful and... You know, just a few years out of Denton, which apparently became Denison College. Yes, um, it did. <laughs> so we should, but it's just, it's interesting because it's, like you said, it's not, you have these two ranges in American kind of big business stories, right? You have the people who are, like, found their own company and they're, t- like, real drivers, and you have these ambitious guys, and he just seems like... He couldn't be at CBS shorter if he wanted to, right? Like, the second he has that opportunity, he jumps ship and is just filled with energy and charisma. And then being at the top at Disney, he wants to grow like some sort of meth head running low, Um, which means that he might go to great heights, but he's destined to essentially run out because that's not the way that you stay at the top forever, right? Like, I'm, I'm not crazy. Like, think of people like Bill Gates who are in charge of his company for 30 years and then left when it was at the top of its game. He was someone who was crazy in his own right, but he found a place and stuck with it forever. These people who are quick to change are the ones who burn out quick, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. It's very true. So after all of that, he was eventually hired to ABC by Barry Diller to be in charge of the uh, cartoons. The big thing that his the biggest thing he accomplished was getting Schoolhouse Rock on the air, which I know everybody has fond memories of, even though we were no born. No shit! What year is this? This is. Let me see. Is I believe something. I believe it started in seventy three. Wow. God, because, like, that's huge. That's up there with Electric Company as, like, kid shows that die, right? I mean, because, like, Sesame Street's at the top, but it's still on the air. Um, but, like, that's a huge deal. Yeah. That says a lot to his, his capabilities that even something that died, we're still talking about 40 years after it went off the yep. air. Well, the original run lasted from 1973 to 1985. Jesus Christ. Wow, I, didn't, I had no idea it was that so long. Yeah. I think I've only seen maybe three episodes of it. And one of them, I'm sure, is Conjunction Junction. No, I don't know what that one is. No. Yeah. All right. <laughs> ollie, 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 get your adverbs here. Now the shot heard round the world. Sorry. It's okay. It's, it's, it's topical at this point, right? Right. <laughs> But the cartoon division was considered a lower department than the primetime lineup, which is where his main rival was, which was Barry Diller, the guy who had hired him in the first place. They were primarily responsible, at least Diller was, for getting something called the Movie of the Week on the air, which was phenomenally popular in the 70s. They would do, like, real-life TV movies. You can still find some of them on, like, YouTube. What do you mean, real life TV movies? Well, like they did one, I think, about the um, uh, Munich, uh, the Munich terrorist attack at the Olympics uh, after it happened, like within the year or two, stuff like so, that. Like, like Lifetime movies, essentially, right? yes. Okay, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. 
Oh, that's funny. He was also praised for his commercial sense while he was doing the cartoons. For example, in Ken Masters' book, one person talked about how after he saw Scooby-Doo, the next season, ABC had a Scooby-Doo clone, except the dog was a ghost. And I could not for the life of me figure out what that show was. Can any of you? A ghost so Scooby-Doo? The dog was a ghost? What year was this? Uh, it was around the same time that Schoolhouse Rock was on the air. It's a it's, oh sure it's called a dog named Scooby. <laughs> yeah, you guys can go fuck yourselves. That was hilarious. Uh, all right. I don't remember that one. I do remember um, the original Ghostbusters. If you guys do. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, that weird one. Yeah, the one with like a gorilla. Yeah, and like three lanky kids that looks like a Scooby Doo knockoff. Which is why the cartoon was called The Real Ghostbusters. Right, right. Instead of just Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Another thing he did that I that was identified in the book was the Jackson 5 cartoon. I do remember that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. How do you remember that one? <laughs> because I think at one point they did a crossover with uh, Scooby-Doo, like we were associating, and so I looked up the original, and it's atrocious. <laughs> Who didn't do a crossover with Scooby Doo at that point? I remember the, the Adams S- Family, Globetrotters. I, I remember Gilligan Sonny and Cher. I remember Sonny and Cher yeah. doing a crossover, and Cher wow. was just grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> what do you expect? Not much. Not much from good old Cher. So after he. Uh, was in charge of the cartoon division. He eventually moved to the West Coast and was in charge of West Coast primetime programming. While he was in charge of that division, he worked with Gary Marshall to launch this show about the 1950s called Happy Days. Wow. Mm-hmm. Hey. Wow. Oh, no. Eisner already had a very established career by the time he got to Disney. You'll be surprised. So far, he's he's batting pretty well, right? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. (laughs) Around the time that Eisner moved out to the West Coast, Diller moved to Gulf and Western, which was part of Paramount. Diller wanted to make a name for himself there and was very much one of those guys who was like, I'm the boss, to the point where when he met famed producer Robert Evans, the guy who produced the Godfather movies... (laughs) Robert Evans is such a dipshit. Yeah. Well, Robert Evans said something to Diller like, I'm so glad we're going to be working together. And Diller responded, we're not working together. You're working for me. To answer your question, John, Eisner started losing goodwill at ABC when he openly fought against TV producer Aaron Spelling, who I know everybody also has heard of. He's the guy that produced Charlie's Angels and I think, what was it, Melrose Place? Or Beverly Hills 90210? He he did everything. Yeah. Didn't he also do the game shows? No, that was a a different guy. That was uh, Chuck Barris, I think you're thinking of. Okay. Spelling was considered a golden boy because he kept producing all of these hits at ABC, again, like Charlie's Angels, but Eisner didn't give him the respect that Spelling felt he deserved. Also, Eisner was clashing with... Fred Silverman, who was the head of ABC at the time. Eisner was concerned that Silverman would get all the credit for turning ABC around, which is eventually what happened. And just so you know, Silverman later left to NBC and crashed and burned when he produced this show called Super Train. Do we want to know what that is? It's Love Boat, except set on a train. Well, he came up with Fantasy Island and Love Boat, so he deserves a little bit of... of One of the spellings did. Not, not Tori. Tori. Not was, Tori. <laughs> uh, to, to be clear, just to clarify, is, is ABC part of Disney at this point? Not at this point. I believe. Let. I am going to consult the wiki real quick on this. Uh, it was in the early '90s that Disney took over ABC. Possibly. Uh, '70s, right? Yeah, this or was eight? the oh. '70s. So okay. wait, this is even better because that means that Eisner did it out of spite because he took over in the early '90s. He he was took over in the mid '80s, and you very well could be correct, Nick. That's, wow. that's, that's wow. awesome! <laughs> How great would it be to be a millionaire, billionaire in charge of a billion dollar company, and take over your former employer? Ah, oh. it's every worker's dream, really. <laughs> I 
I'm sure everybody's had fantasies about that. Speaking of which, um, uh, he didn't do Fantasy Island, but he did do Love Boat. Who, Troy Spelling? Or uh, Aaron Spelling? <laughs> uh, yes, Aaron Spelling. Let's see okay. here. He also did stuff like, for us, he did stuff like uh, Charmed, Seventh Heaven. He did do Beverly Hills 90210. He did Dynasty. He, he didn't yeah, do Dawson's Creek, Dynasty. Uh, it's not listed on the wiki, no. Oh, wait, he did do Fantasy Island. Crap. Oh, wow. I'll let you keep that in. I've allowed you to keep that in. Well, I owe you a beer, Nick, is what that means. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. My liver can take it. <laughs> so after Eisner's relationship with ABC deteriorated, he eventually moved to Paramount, which is where Barry Diller ended up, and became responsible for many of their hits at the time. But nobody in Hollywood really took him seriously. For example, people thought he didn't really know anything about the talent. He was in a meeting with Richard Lester one time and asked Richard Lester, you know, I'm looking for the spirit like the guy who directed those Beatles movies. Do you know who that guy was? Uh, George that's Martin. Really funny. Yeah, George Martin. That's right. No, it, it was Richard Lester, John. <laughs> oh, no. People also accused him of stealing credit for his hits. For example, Grease. He was in charge of Paramount when Grease came out, and that became, I think, the highest-grossing film up to that point. And Eisner was like going, oh, yeah, that was all me. It wasn't. He did produce hits like American Gigolo, but American Gigolo wasn't taken seriously by the studio. But it I was... can't imagine why not. <laughs> yeah, with a title like American Gigolo. Jigahoo? <laughs> uh, carry on alrighty <laughs> he'll do just that <laughs> it was important that he went to Paramount though because this is the place where he met a guy named Jeff Katzenberg or Jeffrey Katzenberg Jeffrey Katzenberg had been a workaholic kid from New York City who wasn't satisfied by money but by what he called the hustle of working Katzenberg never went to college and had instead gotten his professional start working for Mayor John Lindsay's presidential campaign. He lived in the home with other people working in that campaign. While at Paramount, Katzenberg and Eisner did something that I know geeks the world over still praise them for, and that was producing the first Star Trek movie right. in 1979. The pre- Katzenberg is like an episode in himself. Oh, he's he's a series in himself. The guy is up there with Spielberg as kind of creating modern Hollywood, isn't he? Yep. He, yeah. And we'll definitely be getting into their relationship later in the season. Anyway, the production on Star Trek, at least the first movie, had been a disaster. First, it, they had pitched it originally as a Rich, revival. The final, the, the final product doesn't say anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Well. Oh, shit. <laughs> it went wildly over budget. The script had been recycled from an attempt at reviving the TV series, and it was a huge critical flop after it got released. But well, it was supposed to compete with something like Star Wars, wasn't it? Exactly. That was what they were trying to build it up as, as being a huge effects movie. And they take something movie. like Star Wars, which is action-packed and everything like that, and replace it with a movie that's nothing but production stills panning along. <laughs> so... I take it you both have seen the first Star Trek movie then. Oh, so many times. Badly. I remember renting that from Blockbuster myself because I had never seen Star Trek at the time. That's not the one to start with. Well, that's what I started <laughs> with, and that's why... So every other one, everyone knows that. The studio poured $11 million in 70s money into effects, and at the time... A whole lot of cocaine. Yes. Yes, a lot of cocaine. Well, to give you a comparison, overall the studio had spent $45 million on this movie, which doesn't sound like a lot, but at the time, the average cost of a movie was a, less than $10 million. But at the end of the day, it was a box office success and showed Eisner could create one. He was also, that is Eisner, was also credited for bringing a huge success to Paramount with George Lucas and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Interesting. The package, though, that 
Paramount had signed with him was considered far too extravagant to the point where every other studio in Hollywood had turned that package down. It was like an exorbitant cost, and um, uh, the profits from the movies would mostly go to Lucas rather than the studio. Because the studios learned their lesson after Star Wars came out, giving Lucas the uh, uh, the merchandising rights. Well, that's the problem, though. That's where Star Wars made most of its money was from the merchandising, Absolutely. and it all went to Lucas. He took a, a cut in his pay, Lucas did, and said, okay, but I'll get merchandising rights. And that's why every second of that film was hoard out into toys and memorabilia. Well, and this is also bullshit, because... Um, if I recall correctly, Eisner's the guy who brings in eventually things like Star Tours into Disney parks. So is this just a like like a sweet deal, like a honey deal that he does to like Lucas that he just elbows him every you know few years and says, "Hey, remember how I helped you out?" Hmm. Uh, and now like there's a stunt show at MGM that I'm sure Eisner brought in that's both. Star Tours is on one end, and Indiana Jones stunt show is on the other end of MGM Studios at Orlando, Florida. Hmm. That's a good point. I've honestly never um, uh, never thought about that, but, I mean, you're right. Most of the stuff that he was getting at the time, like, uh, Disney had uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark as part of the great movie ride, right? Well, and, and just to your point, right, when you're talking about people like Spelling, Spelling created his own content. He was like... Essentially, if you put all of his shows on one network, he has an entire prime time slate, right? Mm-hmm. Eisner didn't have that. He was a businessman. So he's making contacts with the creatives. And so when he's like, well, I'm going to go and I'm now in charge of Disney, those people I reached out to, you want to help me out? Frankly, uh, the fact that Spielberg ends up helping Universal Studios and said much of it must have been a huge coup because, like, Indiana Jones is is massive, you know. I just rewatched um, uh, Blade Runner, which made me look into Harrison Ford. Mm-hmm. The '80s are him being toured between Lucas and Spielberg, effectively. Well, I, I hate to cut you off, but also at the time, remember Spielberg had just come off a major flop, one of the most legendary in Hollywood, 1941. So he took up this big mm. grand action film to reestablish his box office clout, basically. So he yeah, wanted to go all out. I've never seen it myself. It is long and not funny. Is it supposed to be either of those? Well, it's definitely long, but I think it is supposed to be funny. It stars Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. Oh, that, and it turned out not to be funny? It's weird. Uh, kind of racist, but we'll get there. Well, I'm well, sure it'll be on our podcast. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I don't know. So another thing that Eisner oversaw while he was at Paramount was a movie called Flashdance, which was another huge box office hit that critically nobody took seriously. Still, like he had at uh, ABC, Eisner fought with some of his rival executives, including Barry Diller. He also hated producer Joel Silver, who was famous at the time for producing 48 Hours and would later produce... Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, The Matrix, and I think invented Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, really? Yeah, I Joke. Think, yeah, no, I think he really did invent Ultimate Frisbee. No. I think he did, yeah. No. <laughs> Someone who wasn't a hippie invented Ultimate Frisbee? He's claimed to have invented it. Let's. Well, be- Eisner took credit for a lot of things he didn't get. Well, let's, <laughs> let's see here. Oh, God, I'm looking at his picture now. That is not how I expected him to look like. Oh, ooh. Okay. Eisner attended Columbia High School during his time... Not Eisner. Silver attended Columbia High School during his time there. Silver, Buzzy Hellring, and Johnny Hines created the rules for what he called Ultimate Frisbee. He was later inducted into the USA Ultimate Hall of Fame as a result of this. I'm actually looking up 1941. It's got Christopher Lee in it. It does. <laughs> it's a good cast. It's a weird movie. It's shockingly long. I don't want to see this at all. No. <laughs> Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, who have produced some myopia movies, also clashed with Eisner as they were at Paramount at the same time. They also clashed with Katzenberg because Katzenberg really wanted to recast Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop. 
Why? Didn't think he was funny enough. <laughs> that didn't stop them from making six more Beverly Hills Cops. Two. Or well, there's, a career. there's three Beverly Hills Cops. Be accurate. This this podcast depends on uh, research integrity, John. Come on. Now, you know, they filmed another three and just didn't release them. That's That's probably true. <laughs> so what just is like it? the uh, Roger Coleman Fantastic Fours? <laughs> I love Roger Foreman Corman's Fantastic Four movie. There's a great documentary out there about it that I. Th- it's called the Fantastic Four 2001 film, right? <laughs> no, it's an actual documentary about the making of it. It's fantastic. I think it's called Doomed. Doomed. Oh wow. Yeah. So what eventually led Eisner to Disney was the fact that the top person at Paramount, a man named Charles Bluehorn, died in the early 80s, and it marked an an exodus of the executives from Paramount, including Barry Diller, as well as Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson. Eisner and Katzenberg were selected for the job after the massive debacle that we discussed in the last episode where Disney was almost bought out and they fired Ron Miller. So now we're at. I still can't wrap my head around that. That Disney was so in the tank that mm-hmm. they were almost bought and sold for scrap. Yeah, pretty much. Actually, Eisner fully expected to take the top position at Paramount after Diller left. As and well, not the top position, but the role of studio chief, and he was passed over for the job. So he left to work elsewhere and. Uh, eventually was selected to work at uh, the top position at Disney because Ron Miller had been fired. So he took the top gig at Disney as kind of a fuck you to Paramount. Yes, basically. All right. That, that's a good way to get a career going. Miller had actually asked Eisner to run the film division in 1982, but Eisner also demanded to run the theme parks as well. Miller turned him down and hired Richard Berger instead to run the new film division Touchstone, a film label that would release adult-oriented films. Ah, Berger. Isn't Richard Berger the guy who does Star Trek now? I'm not sure. Or Star Wars? He does one of those franchises, doesn't he? I'm honestly not sure. Let's check out the uh, handy-dandy wiki. Richard Berger is in charge of the Department of Anthropology at Berkeley. That doesn't sound right. No. That doesn't. I mean, it's true. It's a different guy. There's a surprising amount of Richard Bergers in the uh, IMDb, none of whom would really want any of the credits that they seem to be getting. Richard Berger, actor in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Richard Berger, <laughs> camera for Friday the 13th. Uh, Rocky II, Temptation, musical comedy, Time. <laughs> Punisher Warzone. Wow. Wow. That's a great movie. Oh, How dare you? I love Punisher Warzone. <laughs> wow. Well, either way, Berger was hated at Disney because he openly insulted the other executives and called them out of touch and that they said they didn't go to the movies enough. I'm not out of touch. Obviously, the children are. <laughs> I will say, though, he's probably not wrong about them not going to the movies enough. That's like the Academy Award joke that none of them have actually seen the movies. It's just what the press tells them to vote for. <laughs> well, we're, we're looking at the late 80s now, right? Or this is the early 80s, early to mid 80s. So VHS is taking off, right? Yes, around this time. And with VHS, people stopped going to the movies anyway. That was the boom. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Well, I I remember that – well, I don't remember, but I I know that it used to be the only way you could see a movie was in a theater. Yeah, right. And people would go over and over and over again into the the cinema to see these films when they were re-released throughout the year just to to either get air conditioning or to – if you're in the South – or to see the film because otherwise you just couldn't see it. Yeah. And with VCRs and um, uh, VHS – all of a sudden, you could watch these movies at home, not in the theater. Oh, and Disney was well, the master the of that. Well, second used to mean something. And Disney was the master of that. I mean, that was the whole Vault thing was born out of their theatrical re-release schedule. I mean, on its 50th anniversary, I think Snow White was uh, outdoing some of the more modern releases. 
So the person who I believe we discussed in the last episode, but if we didn't forgive me, who was primarily responsible for courting Eisner and Katzenberg was a man named Frank Wells, and that's your famous mountaineer there, John. Oh, that's him. Yeah. Okay. It took a while for Wells and Eisner to convince the Disney board to hire Eisner and Katzenberg. Eventually, Eisner had to go to Lucas and Spielberg and get them involved to get the decision to be finalized. But eventually, the board of directors unanimously voted for Eisner as chief executive and Wells as the chief operating officer. And Wells will eventually be very important later. Keep him in mind. And Katzenberg joined Disney after Eisner became CEO. He was primarily responsible for their film division. So Eisner was in charge of everything. Katzenberg worked for him, but Katzenberg was responsible for making the actual movies. First, when they joined forces at Disney's, there were already a lot of projects in development. Katzenberg first made a deal with, of all people, Michael Jackson to produce Captain EO for the parks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> It was directed by Francis Ford Coppola and produced by George Lucas. It was. Francis Ford Coppola, really? Yep. Yeah. Well, he was so bankrupt after One from the Heart, he just took whatever job he could get. Which, Obviously. Yeah. Wow. And the shooting of Captain EO was... Oh, he has low bar. <laughs> Pardon? We know Lucas has a low bar for <laughs> yeah. his projects. Oh, what, you don't like We Are Here to Change the World? That's just not up to your um, uh, not up to your taste there, John? <laughs> Surprisingly, no. <laughs> no. I'm more of a Howard the Duck kind of person. <laughs> oh, that's a, that whole thing is a separate story. <laughs> Either way, Captain Ea, which was a 17-minute music video, keep in mind, was a disastrous production. The footage didn't have a coherent story and had gone wildly over budget. Lucas at yep. first hid the film from executives while they were doing reshoots to try to salvage it. It was eventually released to a huge success at the parks because Jackson was still the biggest entertainer at the time, but it showed that Eisner and Katzenberg had a long way to go to establish themselves. By the so wait, who hated it? The production... The studio didn't Oh, the production was just a disaster because they're looking at the budget and seeing that you spent like what a million dollars per minute on a 17 minute film what's wrong with you okay all right so so the studio didn't like it from a financial point of view and even from a, a artistic point of view because it didn't make any sense but the public well ate it up because it was george lucas it was michael jackson well, at first, the original footage didn't make any sense. It didn't have a coherent story, which is why they were doing re uh, reshoots behind the executive's back. Oh. oh. okay. By the way, in 1984, right as uh, Eyes, uh, Ron Miller exited and uh, Michael Eisner took over, Disney had its biggest hit in years, which was Splash. But that wasn't enough to revive their, uh, their failing fortunes. So here was something interesting that I found. The first film Eisner and Katzenberg oversaw while they were at Disney was a movie called Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Ah. Ah. I was wondering if either of you guys had seen that. Because I have not. Great. <laughs> it, really? I have, oh, I have wow. not. No. It's because you try to watch classy shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I... I mean, there's nothing wrong with Down and Out in Beverly Hills, but it's like... It's barely a. It stars Nick Nolte and Richard Dreyfus and Bette Midler. I, think. I believe it was the first Disney movie that Bette Midler did, which is what led to Hocus Pocus, which is what led me to drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hocus Pocus wasn't that bad. <laughs> <sighs> I think we did that with Myopia, didn't we? We did. We did in our first oh, season. That, 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 it's behind a paywall. If we had a paywall, I can't afford a paywall. <laughs> Ironically enough. Yeah. yeah, right. you got to spend money to make money. And ironically, it works the other way, too. So far, you'll note something. Splash, Down and Out, and Beverly Hills are live-action films, but Disney was still considered the big animation studio. And the first thing that Katzenberg was overseeing in 1985 was a movie called The Black Cauldron. Oh! 
swing and a miss. <laughs> Which was a huge bomb for Disney. Tatzenberg actually showed how little he knew about animated films because he insisted that there be recuts after a test audience hated it and because he was concerned it wouldn't get a G rating. But traditionally, that's not how animated films were edited. They would be edited in a storyboard portion or at the script portion because after you've spent money on animating something well you're not going to recover that money and black cauldron had already cost 40 million dollars to make by that point katzenberg demanded they put in outtakes in this recut which don't exist in animation he fought and eventually got his way and re-edited the the movie but that re-edited only grossed 20 one million dollars at the box office. That it's already a bomb compared to its forty million dollar budget. But just to give you an idea of how bad a bomb that is, it was outgrossed by the Care Bears movie. <laughs> that was a good movie. Creepy as hell. <laughs> it Not was as bad as uh, Black Cauldron, though. <laughs> But still, Disney had growing successes at the time, not only with their live-action films, but on TV. In 1985, the Disney Channel turned a profit for the first time. Wow. Doing what? We we covered some of the shit that they shoveled out uh, in the last episode. Well, Was it just reruns of that and the Mickey Mouse Club? Well, in 1985, Gummy Bears debuted on NBC, so that's a thing that happened. Gummy bears <laughs> bouncing here and there and everywhere. That's right. Oh, that does me good. My soul feels warm now. That's so good. <laughs> I know the rest of the song, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> they are the Gummy Bears, I think, is the next they song. They are the Gummy Bears. Uh. I adventure that's beyond compare. I used to love that show. That was a fantastic show. I only ever saw a couple things, but I do remember the uh, theme song. Didn't they have to drink, like, some soup or something, and they'd start bouncing? Was- it was Gummy Berry Juice, thank you. Ah. Well, like, wow. If I- yeah, it was like a magic potion that made them invincible and strong. It, it was the Asterix, the Gaul kind of potion. Ah. Well, I just know it came in a cauldron, or at least if my memory serves me correct, it came in a cauldron. So, forgive me. All good things to do. Yeah, there you go. Also, Eisner did take over and was looking at uh, the impact that the theme parks were having because that was still Disney's big revenue. For example, Eisner was the guy who had the idea to put cameras on Splash Mountain. Oh, oh yeah. Cameras. Yeah, yeah, not the look down your shirt kind of cameras. No, no, like the... Uh, super- the pay me 20 bucks for a right. picture cameras. Exactly. Which, of course, backfired after it became unofficially Flash Mountain, but will... Uh, we'll keep it family friendly here. Oh, those kids. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, due to their, so far, due to their moderate success in the film division, what they really needed was a blockbuster. And in 1987, Eisner and Katzenberg finally had one. It was called Three Men and a Baby. Oh, that was God. Disney? Yep. Wow. That was quickly followed by Good Morning Vietnam. That was Disney? It was. Good lord. Well, you'll notice, and this is actually important, that these were live-action movies that had been released through their new adult division, Touchstone. Right. All right. Not animated Hmm. films. Part of the reason for that was because Katzenberg was never sure how much power he had to actually greenlight films. Also, Eisner had set a goal of a new animated film every 18 months... After he came on board. But Kassenberger already swung out with his animated film, right? Well, The Black Cauldron had already been in production, and Katzenberg had taken over after it was finished, and he was the guy who demanded the re-edits in order to salvage it. Okay, so he wasn't wasn't the one that greenlit it. He wasn't the one that oversaw it. Correct. He was just the one that released the final cut. Correct. Okay. Okay. So, what were they going to do on the animated front? Well, and I know one of these has been a previous Myopia episode, the two biggest animated films to come out from Disney during this time was The Great Mouse Detective and Oliver and Company. Oh, good. I like The Great Mouse Detective better. As do I. I do, too. Oliver and Company is still going to probably be an episode, though. Oh, I'm sure. 
The reason for this is that Roy Disney, who was still on the board of directors, wanted to keep the animation division going, even though Disney had been floundering on that front. But Eisner and Katzenberg had no idea how animation was done. Both had a TV... Well, Eisner at least had a TV background, so he frequently wanted the budget cut because TV cartoons had been very cheap to make. Obviously, he knew TV cartoons were of a much lower quality, but... By his logic, for example, if a 30-minute TV episode cost $500,000 to make, then a 90-minute movie would cost, could cost $6 million and look four times as good. Spending something like $20 million on an animated film was just outrageous to him. It, it does seem like an interesting choice that they were chosen to head a, 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 a company that was known for animation, but they had no idea how to make animation at all, let alone how to make it successful. Well, do keep in mind, at the time, Disney was the lowest-grossing studio of the seven major studios, and Eisner had overseen Raiders of the Lost Ark and Flashdance, so he had established box office clout, and it was a way to prevent their buyout. That screams business bullshit, though, doesn't it? Like, he just doesn't know what can't be done. (laughs) Well, but... It does seem like a problem. (laughs) To be fair, and feel free to correct me if I am mistaken, but I believe The Great Mouse Detective was the first time computer animation was ever used in a Disney movie. Yes. Well, in an animated movie. Well, I don't know if that's... I'm not sure if it's 100% true or not. I do know it's one of the earliest that I can think of in Disney, at least, because... Everyone talks about Beauty and the Beast, but that pan around of uh, Big Ben um, in uh, Green Mouse Detective is all CG. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a big deal. You know, it's it's not as long as the dance sequence in Beauty and the Beast, but that that's what I'm thinking. I thought some of the clock tower was uh, computer animated as well with the gears. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, they pan yes. around, then they go inside, then it turns into a clockwork mechanism. Right. But yeah, but you're right. It goes it goes all the way through that. That's correct. So it sounds like everybody likes the Great Mouse Detective still, and doesn't is not so much of a fan of. Um, you mean Billy Joel's uh, Oliver and Company? Yes, Billy Joel's Oliver and Company, which have been particularly difficult to make. Katzenberg didn't like what the animators were working on. Well, the animators didn't like working on it, and Katzenberg didn't like the scenes that he was being shown from it while it was being made. Still, Mm. their primary goal when making Oliver and Company wasn't really artistic, but it was to outgross Don Bluth's An American Tale. (laughs) That's a lofty goal. Yep. No, it's just, it's funny because... He intentionally went out of the system for a lot of reasons, blah, blah, blah. But the idea that they actually thought of him as a threat, I just assumed he was kind of a speed bump, that they were like, oh, he'll fade away. No. Well, it's really embarrassing that Disney is known as the animation studio, and they've had nothing but flops when they have released animation. And yet, Bluth is out there churning out Oscar-winning films like Oliver and Company. (laughs) You mean um, Disney was Oliver and Company, uh... Not all of them, company. I'm sorry. Um, um, five American old, Tale. Yeah, American, American Tale. Tale. Yeah. It's, it's probably an embarrassment that whether they wanted it or not, they knew that Disney had a reputation as the animation studio. Right, exactly. Well, the good news is that Oliver and Company did outgross an American Tale. It grossed $53 million and Tale grossed $40 million. But I'll note that... Tail currently has a much higher Rotten Tomatoes score, 69%, while Oliver and Company has 44%. Really? Yep. Plus, okay. Plus, part of the reason that it did as well as it did was because of a very expensive ad campaign and a lot of pressure on theater owners to keep it in theaters as long as possible. I'm also embarrassed by the fact that it took me way too long to realize that Oliver and Company was based off Charles Dickens. It's just crazy to me. Oh. I mean, a musical oh, oh, oh. based on Oliver Twist, that just makes no sense. It well. didn't tweak to me until, like, years later, hmm. like, maybe a year or two ago, that I realized that the uh, the dog, like, the homeless vagrant uh, dog owner guy was named Fagin. Yeah, and if I recall... That, that's finally twigged for me. Yeah. Well, Billy Joel was named Dodger, wasn't he? 
He was. He was the Archful yeah. Dodger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but, I, I, A, I remember this very well. And, in fact, at one point, um, my dad uh, had a friend of his or whatever. Maybe I'm crazy. Okay, so I swear that the original pull quote was the, 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 the famous story of Oliver with a twist. Oh, really? Ooh. Oh, my God. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, no, I'm fighting bootleg posters, so maybe I'm crazy. But I just I remember watching this one a lot, um, but never thinking it was great. It, not, I mean, not derogatorily. It was fun. I enjoyed it very much. But, like, the idea that you'd call this a classic next to The Little Mermaid or Snow White is a joke. <laughs> and, I mean, to your point, the dog played by Billy Joel, who wrote the music, always wears sunglasses, if I recall correctly. He does. Because he's cool. Because yeah. he's Billy Joel. But, and you see that it's got all the makings of a Disney movie, especially a modern one, that it it's based off a classic story. It's a modern retelling of it. It's got fanciful animals. It's got your um, um, your well-known musical artist, Talent, who's also doing the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's got all the, the paint-by-numbers that Disney is now known for. I don't know whether they were at the time. Th this may have been kind of a test best case in what will become the Disney model. Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. And the primary reason at the time is because they wanted attention to it. I mean, Billy Joel in the mid-80s was huge, right? And also in Oliver and Company were Cheech Marin, Dom DeLuise, Robert Loggia. Wasn't Dom DeLuise also in Five Will Goes West? Or yes, American he was. Tale? He was. So he's playing both sides. He was. Oh, yeah. Also, Bette Midler was in Oliver and Company. I'd forgotten that. Oh. No. So, obviously, you guys already see the problem. Disney at the time was starting to turn around and had more competent leadership in place and was producing blockbusters, but the Disney brand itself had yet to be revived, especially their animated films. That would change with one particular film that would be released for the first time in 1988. And we will discuss the making and release of that film in our next episode. But what is it? What is it? Inquiring Minds want to know. Oh, you'll f oh, I know the answer to this. It's the sequel to Five Go uh, American Tale. It's Five Will Goes West. Ah, a classic with John Cleese as the villain. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the lazy eye. Uh, <laughs> what, wasn't there a Blues Brothers song in that movie, too? I'm pretty sure there was, yeah. I can safely say I've never seen that. Uh, I remember even the trailers when I was 10, or what, maybe 10 years old, thinking, this looks like garbage. <laughs> I remember watching that very frequently when I was a child, so I think that should, I'm willing to defend But are you better for it? I think we're going to do it at one point, because I remember watching it. I don't remember it being bad or good. I just remember it being funnier than five, the original American Tale, right? Like it, it's at least like mildly lighthearted. Like say it was a point to say, wasn't it? Yeah. It was Jews coming to America. It was escaping a pogrom, if I recall correctly. Exactly. It was. Yeah. Because in America um, which, there are no cats. No cats. Which is why I think the theme park rides at um, Islands of Adventure are based on an American tale, or uh, Fifle Goes West instead of an American tale. Like, the escape, the it's the, the communist cast does not have as much no. fun as... Right Fifle Goes West is definitely more of a Disney film than American tale. Yeah. I mean, and I guess to your point, Daniel, what we'll get to eventually is how Eisner becomes almost a parody of himself by the end. Yes, we ex absolutely will. Essentially... Disney ends up pretty much at the same place they were, despite a decade and a half of hits and a lot of uh, restored business and artistic clout. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and tune in next time where we tell the next chapter of Michael Eisner and the Disney Renaissance. In the meantime, you can also check us out on the main feed at Myopia Defend Your Childhood. And, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, upcoming changes to Mission Briefing? Oh, well, thank you for the plug, Daniel, that uh, I will now be the showrunner for Mission Briefing, which is all things James Bond. And while we don't have a, a new film coming out anytime soon, 
Uh, we will have plenty of content coming in the coming months, and uh, it, it should be fun. It should be good, and uh, keep an eye out for it. And Nick, our fearless leader, our guru, the man who makes this all possible, what have you got coming up? Uh, uh, well, um, we plug myopia a lot, but uh, keep tuning in there. Myopia Mornings is getting off to a good start, but slower than I want, damn it. So uh, tune in to Myopia Mornings. We're doing mostly Saturday morning cartoons, uh, a few mix-ups here and there. Um, so, But I will plug some other things. Um, I'm a riffer at Cineprof, which is an Atlanta – based podcast um, movie riffing comedy group uh, we do improvised kind of movie riffs over some real shitty movies um, we're at the Plaza Theater on Ponce so look us up Cineprov on Facebook um, and at Plaza so you can buy tickets and stuff in advance um, and then I do a history podcast which is just about to wrap up its first season um, but in January we're already coming back with our second season so don't you worry about it uh, called Doom to Repeat. Me and, uh, and a professor at Georgia State University named Alex Cummings do historical topics, um, but uh, I take academics and kind of make them more conversational so you don't feel like you need to take notes. Um, we've done things on Russia and sanctuary cities and the anti-vax movement. We have stuff on Frankenstein and stadiums coming up in the next season. Um, but other than that, listen to all the Myopia and Dude Letter podcasts, including Geekly Oddcast, um, Otter Worlds, um, things like Mission Briefing, of course, with John. Uh, please be listening to Disremembered, of course, if you hear this and you're not listening to Disremembered, I owe you five bucks. <laughs> and Myopia Defender Childhood, among several other projects in the pipeline. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you very much, and tune in next time. Mm-hmm.